My name is Kevin Mahaffey, and I'm going to be speaking today about the changing notions of privacy in American culture. And I would like to start with a quote from Scott McNeely, who is the CEO of Sun Microsystems in 1999. And he said, you already have zero privacy. Get over it. Sorry. Uh, when most people talk about privacy issues in America, they focus on the government interaction with the individual and the abuses within that context. And it's very representative of the disciplinary notion of technology, which is used to enforce laws and punish individuals based on infractions of those laws. And the disciplinary notion of surveillance carries no individual benefit, which has made it widely unpopular for the individual. And it's only perceived as a threat to individual liberty and freedom. And this has mainly created a culture of mistrust, reinforced by everyday examples of disciplinary surveillance. And I'd first like to talk about the dystopian literature of 1984 by George Orwell. And with Big Brother and the telescreens, all technology is used for is to uh, reduce liberty and enforce the laws of the current regime. And the uh, culture of mistrust is also reinforced by real totalitarian, totalitarianism, such as the Nazi Germany and Bolshevik Russia, which serve as concrete examples of faults of disciplinary surveillance. However, parallel to the growth of government surveillance, commercial surveillance has really taken root in society. And this began in the 19th century to combat the danger of anonymous individuals in business. There were two brothers called the Tappans who uh, started the whole trend by interviewing and keeping records of all the merchants they dealt with. And this really became a huge trend in the business industry where these two brothers ended up opening the first credit agency where they had uh, over 10,000 agents, including a young Ulysses S. Grant and Abraham Lincoln at one point. And like a self-issued SSL certificate, the problem with this was that it was, wasn't authoritative. And you only could tell the profile and link that with the person by the name. And that was a huge problem, especially in the mid 20th century when the growth of financial services prompted huge amounts of fraud uh, occurring everywhere. And the authoritative link originally came from the government. And it started with Roosevelt's social security policy which created a unique ID for any individuals, and this was a huge privacy issue in the time. But Roosevelt uh, pitched it to the people by saying that the social security number would only be used to dole out benefits, and it would be basically an, an aid service, and it carried no problem for the individual. And uh, this was not to be shared with law enforcement of any kind, which, as you know, has definitely changed recently. And in the mid-20th century, as consumer reliance on the financial services grew, so did fraud, and the social security number was definitely used as a link between an individual and multiple databases. And the public essentially had no choice in the acceptance of social security numbers because the benefits provided by the financial institutions greatly outweighed the seemingly small loss of privacy. For example, you can't cash your paycheck without your social security number, you can't get credit, and there's no insurance available. And now this small step for the social security number made it possible for all private databases to be cross-queried, and this made the personal definitive profile uh, possible, essentially. And now we reach today where commercial surveillance is greatly greater than, or greatly more prevalent than government surveillance, and it's interestingly not seen as a threat because there's no law enforcement attached to it. It's in the background, it's non-invasive, and it's only used for benefits such as loans and check cashing. And one congressman has commented on this saying that Big Brother has simply subcontracted sub out to corporate America. And the, the, the big idea behind this commercial surveillance is to put people in demographic categories. And now we reach a time where that media is so interactive that you need such precise demographic categories that passive monitoring is, monitoring is not enough, and it's the reality and daily life of the individual that really matters. And this is only accomplished by comprehensive surveillance whereas people have inter interaction with monitor monitoring tools, which is a type of surveillance normally associated with governments, but now is being accepted as a positive good because companies are offering rewards for people to submit themselves to the surveillance. Which brings me to the main topic of what I want to speak about today, and that's how the public is embracing surveillance as normal when commercial. They're becoming nonchalant in their reaction to inc these increasingly invasive mecha mechanisms, and that's mostly because companies are giving incentives for the person to give them their information. There was a pizza parlor up in Berkeley by UC Berkeley that if you gave all the information required to set up for a credit card number, they would give you a free 12-inch uh, pizza. And they have lines out the door for people giving out this information that could be used for identity theft or anything like that, all for a $5, $5 pizza. 
And uh, this is also being reinforced by the cultural phenomena of the webcam and blogging movements and the reality TV, where surveillance is entertainment. It's no longer Big Brother trying to get you. It's, it's a way to make your life more complete and be a trendsetter and all that. And there are a lot of ancestral circles in this privacy market of reality TV. Like Big Brother, for example, all these housemates, for a chance at fame and celebrity status, sell their privacy to the producers. And the consumers, for, for a promise of inter interactivity and free entertainment, go to the show's website. They fill out surveys, fill out their own demographic information. And the producers can data mine this to reinvent the show's presentation and, in turn, give exact, uh, increase their ratings by giving the people exactly what they want. And from this increasingly advanced data mining software comes consumer ranking and categorization, where content delivery becomes more interactive. You have more detailed data mining required. And Google is the prime example of this incredibly detailed data mining to present interactive content. In their AdSense, they track your links, or your previous click habits, your website history, and your geographic location to display targeted ads. And the new, G new Gmail system does all of the above, plus it, uh, it reads all of your personal correspondence to put you in a very precise demographic category. When people are going crazy over these Gmail accounts, I mean, it's, a Gmail account is like gold right now. So it, sh it shows that the loss of privacy is really not an issue for most Americans or most users of Gmail. And the reason is, is because with corporate surveillance is that consumers only receive ben benefits. This is not to say that advertisements are benefits, but targeted as advertisements are better than untargeted ads. One scholar presents the example of the modern newspaper, which is basically a marketer's nightmare. It's 100 pages. Men are passing up women's clothing ads. Children are passing up shampoo coupons. And, this, and it's completely a waste of time and energy. And they argue that by, with demographic data, you can present the content and the ads that you are interested in, thereby saving you time and energy. And they present it as a positive good. And all this data is very useful, but how, how is it being gathered? First of all, there, in, during the dot-com era, there was a company called freepc.com, which offered a free computer in exchange for complete monitoring and displaying advertisement on, on the screen at all times. And despite this blatant breach of privacy, the uh, almighty power of free prevailed, and they received 300,000 applicants the very first day. And one of the problems with consumer categorization is that it's often overlooked by privacy-minded individuals when presented by all these benefits, such as free computers and celebrity status by these companies. And we're possibly entering a new age of automated discrimination by databases. For example, in some phone company call centers, people are tagged as they call to the operator with a red, yellow, or green. Green customers are the profitable customers, and the operators are instructed to bend over backwards, give them anything they want. Yellow, yellow customers are marginally profitable. They're to be dealt with, but no, no uh, concessions have been made to them. And for the red customers, you know, the operators are told to be assholes, try to get rid of them if, if at all possible. And how do, you, how do you fix your rating if you're red, green, or yellow? Um, you can't really leave this system. All you can do is generate more data, which creates a vicious cycle of surveillance. And the TiVo is a really good example of this, where everything you watch on the TiVo system is sent to the main headquarters. And they classify you as a certain type of demographic category. And there was one guy in Los Angeles who was somehow classified as gay under the TiVo system. And he didn't like that because he thought he was straight. So he decided to watch a whole bunch of war movies and guy stuff. And so the data money looked at all this data and saw this fixa fixation with violence and started recording documentaries of Joseph Goebbels thinking he was a neo-Nazi of some sort. <laughs> but um, this, this, this pop culture fascination will eventually disappear and will be left with all the surveillance infrastructure everywhere. In the UK, for example, there's a CCTV system almost on every business step, on every apartment building. And that's not going to be taken down. And you're going to be left with the infrastructure in a habituated public where they're going to be used to surveillance, so they're going to see no need to get rid of it. So you can't, I mean, it's really impossible to get rid of infrastructure once it's creative. So we need some kind of human accountability. Right now, we only have a trust accountability, which works at something like this, where you can refuse a company's services. For example, the supermarket discount cards, you maybe don't want to take that 10 cent discount on potatoes if you don't have to because of all your purchasing habits are being tracked. But right now, there's nothing that's happening with those purchasing habits. You're not being discriminated against. So there's no reason for people not to use these privacy eliminating tools. However, uh, once gathered, the data is mostly harmless in the almighty words of Douglas Adams in commercial hands. 
and there are basically no repercussions for generating data right now. But what if the government buys or seizes uh, these commercial databases? In the 1980s, uh, a whole bunch of kids gave their addresses and birthdays to an ice cream parlor for, in exchange for a free Sunday on their birthday. And the government actually bought this database and used all the names and birthdays to send draft cards on the kids' 18th birthdays. <laughs> Uh, and surveillance is such that these incentives to, to surrender the privacy are worth far less than the data. Uh, I mean, the ice cream probably cost 10 cents, and the government, I'm sure, paid much more than that to glean the data off of the, the company. And people, especially with, when things are given away for free, they don't, they don't think about how much their personal data is worth because they succumb to the almighty power of free. And it's really not prudent for anyone to have surveillance powers over population because the data, mostly homeless in the hands of advertisers, is dangerous in government. If an Adolf Hitler or even worse, Jerry Falwell would become president, the gay TV guy wouldn't last 30 minutes into Patton before he'd be sent to a gulag. I mean, it's, once all this data is gleaned, it's, it's anybody's business and it's not just the company you gave it to. And um, I'd like to open it up for questions if you have any comments or... Yes, okay. Well, thank you very much.